Hey everybody, welcome to Watches with Dennis, and we've got another Saturday live stream. And I have no idea if this topic is going to be good or not, but we're going to try and make it work as best we can. And that is to really go over neglected luxury watch brands as defined by me. So before we get started, uh, just in terms of updates, uh, what's been going on lately in the realm of watches that might be relevant to you all in terms of what I've been doing. Not a lot. Obviously, I've had one video out this week. Well, technically two, but only one of note. And that is, I finally got the review done of the Zenith Chronomaster original that ideally I would have done. Oh, oh sorry, oh got my audio double looped there. Uh, ideally, would have had that done last week at some point, but I was out traveling, so was unable to do that. And uh, so I got that out. And then the other video that doesn't really count that I was going to mention was uh, I did a remix of the Tudor 1926 uh, review as a short. Um, don't, don't know why I was wondering, maybe that was a good way to promote the review videos. That's actually my most popular review video. Uh, not my oldest, but it is, it's one of the older ones. I think that was back before I had a camera that could shoot in 4k. Uh, but that one, for whatever reason, probably because it's a fairly affordable, uh, tutor in the realms of, uh, luxury pricing. It's, I mean, the tutor 1926 of their current production, I think is their cheapest. Uh, I'd be unsure given the black bay, but, um, but now that the Black Bay has the in-house movement, I don't think that uh, I don't think it's the cheapest anymore. So uh, those are the main things uh, in terms of that. In terms of what am I wearing today? I'm not wearing a luxury watch uh, because what I wear is basically has like next to no sync up with whatever I'm talking about on this channel. So today I am wearing my uh, Seiko SRPH57. Uh, dive watches is on a uh, canvas uh, Barton Bands strap. I bought a few of those. Oh, gosh, I don't know, maybe two months ago or so, I thought I'd try canvas out, in part because I was considering Blanc Pond. Um, Blanc Pond bathyscapes that come on canvas, uh, or excuse me, sailcloth straps. And I'd never worn a watch with a sailcloth. So I thought, well, I should probably get at least something of a feel for it. These are okay. I uh, Barton silicone straps feel a lot better than these. These uh, they're very stiff when they come, and you have to uh, uh, kind of manipulate them to get them to to sit, which is probably pretty standard. But they're almost like a leather backed, and I would have preferred like a rubber because when I if I go out for a walk later today, for example, and I sweat, yeah, you know how leather gets with with sweating. So I would have preferred that it was backed with something else. Obviously, sailcloth wouldn't be the most comfortable on the skin, so I understand the need to back it. Just probably wouldn't have backed it with this leather-esque material because it just seems sort of absorb absorbent, and I don't know how well or long it will stand up. And I realized, actually, I had my uh, screen share. Uh, that was a little bit of a teaser for <laughs> what, when you saw the Ulysse Nardon, uh, for what we're going to talk about today. So I think that's most of the stuff. So in terms of watches, uh, I want to spend about the next hour or so going over brands that we might think of as uh, as underappreciated. I went with a title neglected because it sounds much more you know important if we say things are neglected versus <laughs> versus underappreciated. Uh, but that's what essentially we're getting at. And these are just as defined by by whoever whoever wants to think about them. So, uh, I actually did share with my uh, my 99 cent club, which I, I've posted a, a link in the uh, in the chat. If you're interested in the 99 cent club, it's as the name was just 99 cents a month. And uh, anyway, so they got a, a sort of sneak peek at the topic and I asked for them to give me suggestions on watch brands. Of course, people who are here live are able to give suggestions as well in terms of uh, what we should maybe talk about. Also, if anyone wants to participate in the live stream, it doesn't just have to be me talking. Uh, so I have shared a link to the StreamYard. You do, would obviously need a microphone and a webcam in order to do that. But if that is of interest, that is shared in the chat. So, uh, and I did get uh, several, actually three different people give me suggestions on brands to go over. And I wanted to start though with the ones that I had already come up with. So as we're going along, you know, this is all very interactive. Uh, and I want to say uh, good morning, uh, Tuna. Uh, welcome to the live stream, as well as to Kevin and to Richard. I hope you all enjoy today's topic. And for those watching recorded, uh, hello, but you can't chat with me. 
because you weren't here live. That's just how it works. That's the it's science. It's science. It's the science. It's just science. Okay. So I had three brands that I wanted to bring up that I think of as kind of neglected luxury watch brands. And some of these are shifting. I think some of these are becoming more appreciated now. Some of these used to be really appreciated and I think are less so at this stage. Obviously, you'll know what all I'm going to talk about because I load everything up in tabs ahead of time because I believe in efficiency. But one of the ones I wanted to start with was Ulysse Nardon. Now, I've got some freaks loaded on the screen. And the reason for that is, but for the freak, I don't hear anyone ever talk about Ulysse Nardon. So they were owned by a holding company, uh, Keating, I think was the name of it. The, they owned Gerard Perigo as well. And while, while I feel Gerard Perigo is getting a lot of attention, whether it's warranted or not, is something we could debate. But there was definitely, in my opinion, a push to make Gerard Perigo a hype brand when we were seeing the, pi the pandemic pricing, the price spikes on the Daytonas, the Nautilus, well, all Rolex, really, uh, Royal Oaks. There was a push by some gray market dealers and gray markets inaccurate. Let's say backpack slingers would be more specific because they weren't really uh, acquiring unworn watches, at least not in the traditional fashion from authorized dealers. Nonetheless, there seemed to be a push to make Gerard Perigos popular. And uh, I think it worked to at least some degree. Uh, definitely not a brand that I would say is hype, but uh, a brand that has a lot of appreciation going on for it, especially the Laureato, uh, be that because it gives you the integrated bracelet uh, aesthetic without having to go into that Royal Oak price scheme or not. Saying aside, we're not really here to talk about GP. But Ulysse Nardon was owned by the same company, and they're independent now. And I'm hoping that means we see something happen with them. However, this is the only watch that anyone talks about out of Ulysse Nardon. And they're pretty pricey. I mean, you can, used, you can find them under $20,000, some of them. Uh, at least I believe last I looked, you could. I don't know anyone who owns one of these, though. Um, it was very cool when it came out. And that's it. Like, that's all I could tell you about you. Like, I know a little bit more about Ulysse Nardon because I've looked into them before. Uh, very, very famous nautical aesthetic. In fact, uh, part of the issue with them might be um, that is a brand that was historically very popular in Russia. And I, I, you know, I don't know if they're just selling them there now or not, or what's with everything going on in Russia, uh, buying new watches is probably not a high priority for, for a lot of people in that country. Uh, but it's something that I think was fairly tied, uh, sort of, you know, in the naval aesthetic to, to the, to the country. But saying that aside, it's all freak, 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 freak. And I can't say it's actually said all that much other than people remember like the the old timers who were in this hobby well before me remember when the freak was revealed and like it was like one of those seminal watch announcement moments kind of like when all long and zona launched launched in their in 94 or whatever the whole lineup the four pillar watches that they came out with and it was like whoa this is really cool um the freak was like that though i'd say even more cool from an engineering perspective um but it's just sort of been what it is. So that's one that I wanted to bring up is what I feel is a neglected watch brand. Now I see Tuna has weighed in and has said, they always say that Gerard Perigro is sadly underrated. Maybe it deserves to be rated higher than it is, but I don't think it's a, what you know, again, we're using my loaded term, neglected. I don't think it's a neglected watch brand. And the reason for that is I hear a lot of people talk about it. I see a lot of people uh, comment like if I do a video on on GP, it tends to get more comments than some other brands that I would do. Uh, there's a lot of support for them, uh, and so again, maybe it's one of those things where reality and the collector community are they're like there's a big gap. Kind of like if you look at the Morgan Stanley report and you look at Tudor, for example, Tudor's not all that high up on the Morgan Stanley Swiss watch sales list, which suggests the general public is not buying Tudors in such volumes that it's pulling in a lot of money for Rolex as an organization. But like we talk, and again, because I do this on YouTube, I can tell you like YouTube, if I do a Tudor video, it's smart to do a Tudor video. The algorithm loves Tudor videos because you all like to consume them. Um, GP isn't Tudor consumed or Seiko consumed, but I get more clicks on a GP video than I would if I did a UN video. I'm guessing. I actually don't think I've ever actually done a video just on a Ulysse Nardon model. Uh, as I think about him, because I don't ever hear anything. 
other than maybe they're working on a new iteration of the freak. But uh, now, Scott, welcome to the live stream, Scott. And Scott has some suggestions we are going to uh, we are going to tackle in this episode because he is one of the 99 Cent Club members and he shared some thoughts with me ahead of time. Um, he's not sure what the appeal is with the freak. Uh, I think it's solely the engineering, right? So we look at the. I'll, I'll you know we'll zoom in on one here. Uh, not an attractive watch, but avant garde, right? And some people are really into avant garde. In fact, some of the suggestions that the 99 Cent Club provided to me were very avant-garde brands. And so I'd say at least two, two of the brands we're going to talk about, very, very avant-garde. And so I think that's the appeal just in terms of um, how this thing moves and all of that. Um, I think there's a video when we go just to the, just to the freak page in general. Uh, there we go. Sorry, it's going to be a little choppy probably because of how uh, how StreamYard works. But there you go. You see kind of how it, how it's supposed to move around and stuff. I don't know how you read it. Like I've never handled one of these. But that is that's why people are into the freak is because it's a, it's freakish. That's the that's the only appeal that I know of to it. So it's an in, it's an engineering marvel. That's the that's the value behind it. Uh, Koji, welcome to live stream, says, when I hear the term neglected, I immediately think of a watch company with a glorious past that's just a shadow of itself now. Universal Genève, interesting. We might need to go into some of those. Universe And Angelus. Angelus um, did have a watch collab. Or I think it was a collab. Did they collab with uh, Messina Lab? They had a really interesting doctor's watch uh, that I think I talked about earlier in the year. But um, yes. Uh, definitely I could see why you would get that impression. I, of course, use the term neglected because it's clickbaity. So I've tricked you all, tricked you all into my, I got to open my diet, my diet sun kiss, sorry. Into the stream. Underappreciated might be a little bit better uh, perspective in terms of how we, how I sort of presented it to the, at least to the club members. Uh, Tuna notes, look at Quorum. They must count as neglected brand. Uh, and that's a good point. Quorum is a brand I've heard about a lot. Universal Geneva is another one, like what Koji mentioned, but I never look at them. Like, uh, I I could probably describe a Universal Geneva watch to you, a vintage one, because I've seen them. I couldn't, like, if you say, Dennis, describe a core, name a Quorum watch, name a model. I can't, I can't name one for you. I don't, I don't know anything about them. So, so that's how it is. Yes, Sunkist is still made. Um, it is a Seven Up brand uh, product, and uh, I like it because it's the one orange soda pop in America that I am aware of. Major brand that it has caffeine in it. Most of them, like Fanta, do not. Which is why I don't drink Fanta because I'm addicted. I'm weak. Let me feed on my weakness. Speaking of weak, let's talk about another neglected watch brand. Again, this is this is a second one for me. I had three that I wanted to throw out there, and then I'm going to hit with the rest of the 99 cent club people sent in ahead of time because I was able to tab them up. And then we can also explore back what some of you in the chat have been have been suggesting. And Tuna notes, the Admiral's Cup. Okay, I've heard of the Admiral's Cup, but again, I'm not familiar. Most of the sports things that watches sponsor, I don't watch. Uh, but then that, I shouldn't say it like that because that makes it sound like I watch a lot of sports. I watch one sport, American football. That's it. I, I used to watch boxing uh, and I don't, I don't even watch that anymore. Just football. That's all I do uh, anymore. So I might catch some of March Madness with basketball because I did go to KU. So, and Syracuse, which are both uh, winning, winning schools, uh, at least within my lifetime. But all right. So I want to now hit on uh, Glashuta Original. So this is a Swatch Group brand. Uh, again, fairly well-known name. I like the word neglected in this instance, though, less so for the clickbaity nature of the of the title. So obviously, that's the main motivator. Uh, and rather, in this case, I think this is a good way to describe uh, brands that are run by companies or conglomerates that don't advertise them. So it doesn't feel like Glashuta gets any attention whatsoever from Swatch. The watch collectors actually appreciate the brand more than I think Swatch does. But that being said, you see, I have one thing loaded up. This is in their, their specialist um, lineup. They're all CQs, though. Everything, I think, in the specialist collection, or however it's pronounced, are some variant of the CQ. And this is the one watch that, when I hear from collectors talk about Glashuta Original, or I'll just say Geo, when they talk about Geo, they talk about CQs. And that's, that's basically it. So... Um, I mean, 
I had a Pano. Uh, the Pano line's pretty famous, but I don't know a lot of people that actually discuss it. Um, and I thought I might try and load you up a, a, a better shot. There we go. Here's some, here's some shots. I, do I have this muted? I hope no. I guess not. Yeah. I'll let you watch a little bit of a clip there from it. But so this is a model I see talked about a lot. And actually, there we go. Koji actually just said it. I was about to say it myself. Uh, Teddy Baldassar. He brings it up a lot. Now, I maybe he's a Geo dealer. I'm not sure because, uh, like, I know he he does Zenith and a lot of brands. That would be part of the reason I would speculate that he would bring it up a lot. However, when I do see on Reddit, which is another area that I that I look at a lot of watch content on, uh, CQs do come up when people are like, I want a luxury dive watch, but I don't want a Submariner. So what, what comes up in terms of suggestions? You'll have uh, Blanc Pond sometimes if people are willing to say a higher price point, which is interesting to me because Blanc Pond is a higher price point new. But if you're willing to go used or gray market, you can get a you can get a, a 50 fathoms well under the retail price of a Submariner, Submariner without date. Um, uh, Seamaster, of course, you know, Omega, got to have Seamaster, especially on cheaper end. Uh, but Geo does get mentioned a lot. These CQs do get mentioned. So, but other than that, I don't ever hear anything from collectors, broadly speaking, about Geo. On occasion, you might have someone, a YouTuber, maybe, I don't know if Teddy's done it, but some others have, where you'll, they'll do like a pano date and they'll talk about it as like being the poor man's uh, longa one. And that's it. That's pretty much it. So I think this is definitely a neglected brand. Uh, regardless of what the collector community thinks about Geo, Swatch doesn't seem to do. Does anyone know? Have you ever? Have any of you ever seen a Geo ad like on a sports thing? Like how Omega, like Omega, a big sponsorship. Like obviously Omega's Olympics, but does Geo have something like? I don't know. Is there like a? Is there like a Squire Cup to go with the Admiral Cup, and Geo can have the Squire Cup? I don't. I don't know what these cups do, but that's what that's what I'm throwing out there. Uh, so that's my second one is, uh, is, is geo. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tuna says Glashuta looks to be an excellent brand. It does indeed seem neglected. There is a, uh, I wish I still had it. I've done a live stream on it before, <clears throat> but there was a report an, an analysis, I should say on a blog where they took a bunch of the luxury watch brands, all the major ones. And they mathed out based off of like, aver I don't remember they used average price point. I think it, it was average price point um, of the watches and watch uh, hours put into making the watches. Da, 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 da. There's some, anyway, they did, they tried to do some analysis on like the dollars or watchmaker hours per dollar that uh, a watch could be purchased for and how much watchmaking, like hand done watchmaking you'd get. The best bang for buck in their equation by far was GO. Like, because you can get like the hand engraved balance cocks and, you know, you had also like gold on the rotors and stuff, but you could find them at such a lower price point compared to other things that had that level of horology in them. Really good deal, but they're not cheap. So it's not like you can go and buy them for the same price as a Speedmaster or Seamaster. You, you do need to go up more in pricing, at least new, but you can get a lot more like, yeah, like if you're like, oh, I want an engraved balance like uh, Longa, yep. Geo can be had for under ten thousand because they do steel and they do steel cheaper. So anyway, it's just one of those. It's just one of those interesting things. Um, Koji notes uh, they're excellent watches and not just a poor man's Longa as they're often described as. Their looks are very different. I can see why, like when we talk the panel line, why people would get the vibe like. But it doesn't like the dial configuration is asymmetrical, but it is not. The Longa layout, it's a very different layout. In some ways, I actually prefer some of the aspects to the Pano. Like, they, uh, their, their date discs, because they do big date, or pano, panorama date, hits, that's why it's called a Pano, for those that didn't know. The, um, they're on the same level. So they've got two discs, and they're on the same level. With the Longa, at a distance, it looks good, but it's stepped because the dials are basically overlapping. So the big date, one of the windows is actually lower than the other window. It's a little... It's a little weird. Um, I mean, they frame it well. And it's, it's, I mean, it, it's a nice looking. I wouldn't have bought it. It wasn't a nice looking watch. But but I do think Geo pulled it off in terms of how the date leveling, it looks better on the Geo, in my opinion. Now, Longa, I think, executes better with their whole golden ratio thing that they went with. But 
the geo dial looks like it's a good it's a good asymmetrical dial asymmetrical dials are real easy to screw up and i think glashuta knows what they're doing in regards to that scott notes i'm a fan of the brand you had an attractive panel i did but it's gone now died now sad i actually really like the green uh, panos i have a really nice green but it's not the year green anymore so we gotta let that go scott also says my girlfriend had the same complaint you did she wasn't a fan of the font used yeah it's i mean it's uh, there's always something there's always something that, that's going on with with all these and tuna notes hardly any mention of geo in the uk at least now you all have a brand i almost mentioned i think oh uh, let me hedge tuna you can correct me is Union Glashuta sold in the UK? It is not sold in America. And I almost put Union Glashuta on the list, but that again really leaned into Swatch Group neglecting Swatch Group brands. So for those that don't know, Union Glashuta, I've heard mixed things. So the last thing I recall hearing is supposedly they work out of a space like within the same facility as Glashuta. So Geo has UO inside of it, is what I heard. But it's a separate brand. Uh, they do a lot of like, let's take Etta's or Salidas or whatever. They reassemble them though in the UO factory. So they get to say made in Germany. And they have a series of designs that lean more in the Geo Wanga aesthetic, like more of that style. Uh, to me, there are two styles of German watchmaking that I think of. You have the Geo UO style. So asymmetry, uh, really clean dial layouts, uh, that sort of stuff. And then you have Bauhaus, which is like Nomos and, and Young House and what they do. The Bauhaus aesthetic, super stripped down, uh, which I don't I don't like Bauhaus when it comes to watches personally. So I prefer this other format. And UO has, uh, or, uh, yeah, or I'm saying, I should say UG, I guess, U Union Glashuta has that look, but they don't sell them here. Um, like they're in Dubai, they're in, I think, some of the Asian markets, uh, but... Uh, and Europe. They're throughout Europe. I wasn't sure if they're in the UK, uh, but they are not sold by Swatch in America. There's not a single authorized dealer in, in North America, period, I don't think. Like Mexico and Canada don't have it either. Um, Tuna says, yes, Dennis, I think so in small numbers. Yeah, it's not a major brand, but it's an interesting one. Like I, I really was leaning to them originally when I was getting into watch collecting because for one to two thousand dollars, I could have gotten a German design that appealed to the aesthetics I like because I don't like Nomos. I just don't like the way it looks. And I don't like Young House for the same reasons. So, but when it was like, I'd have to go on Chrono 24 and import one, I was just like, never mind. This is not worth it. It's not worth the money anymore. So I never did it. All right. So my third and final one that I came into this video, Wayne, to suggest as a neglected brand is Mont Blanc. So Mont Blanc. Uh, getting a lot more attention from watch journalists lately. I don't know. Do any of you who are in the live chat or if you're watching uh, on the recording, feel free to leave a comment. If you, I don't know anyone who's owned a, a, a Mont Blanc watch. I actually have a Mont Blanc uh, pen that I never write with because it doesn't, it doesn't cooperate very. I actually still have it on my desk here. It's a, it's not, it's not a fountain pen. This is a, some uh, ink uh, roller pen, which I thought I used to use a lot of roller pens and I'd burn through the ink so fast. And I thought maybe I should get a nice one. Uh, long story short, there was, you know, super cheap gray market Joma shop thing. And then on my glass desk, it does not work. It does not write well. So I end up. So this is my favorite pins that I use are Bix. I have a whole bag of Bix. I love Bix. They're my, they're usually my go-to. But anyway, uh, that's what I knew Mont Blanc for. And um, so, but they make watches and those watches are, Interesting. So I've loaded up a screen here, very specific screen, because I wanted to show you. For me, I think the reason why Mont Blanc is neglected is twofold. And we're going to hit on this with some of the 99 cent club member suggestions, because I think some are falling in the same realm. But for me, Mont Blanc has two problems. One, it's what basically what Tuna has said in live chat, not too shabby for a pin company. Exactly. Everyone thinks of them as a pin company because that's all they're known for. I mean, hardcore collectors will know they make watches, but that is not like, I don't even know where you like walk in and like randomly encounter a Mont Blanc watch. I mean, there must be ADs that carry them, I just, but I've never seen them. Um, so there's that aspect. The other aspect is they're operating in a really, really, really broad price range. Now, I don't know how well you all can see these, but 
because Mont Blanc bought the Minerva uh, uh, watch make like the movement maker. That's I'm, like, I'm choking on my words. I was going to say watchmaker, which is true, but movement makers. So see, look at this. So the Mont Blanc 1858 unveiled timekeeper Minerva. If they say Minerva in the title, they're emphasizing that it uses a Minerva movement. But look at this price. It's $40,000. Then there's one that's not branded as Minerva. It's less than $3,000. Oh, look, here's another Minerva. It's $30,000. Oh, look, here's a chronograph that doesn't say Minerva. It's $5,000. So that's the catalog. That's how the whole thing goes. They have watches in their online list, no discounting or anything, just on the MSRP that are under $2,000. And note, I think I'm only listing men's watches here too. So here, Mont Blanc Tradition Automatic Date 40. $1,970. Looks kind of like a 1926 or something out of long jeans. Here's another one kind of like that. 32 millimeter though. It's $2,115. Up. All the way up to, you know, once you get Minerva movements in, they're five figure. And yeah, some of those were limited, but I, I think they like limit all of their Minerva stuff. Here's a $54,000 Minerva. Here's a 36.5 Minerva. So, if they're not branding it as Minerva, it's all branded. I mean, it's sub-branded, right? This is the Seiko Grand Seiko problem that they used to have and I think still somewhat carries over. But so where, you know, you have Seiko on the dial and then you'd have Grand Seiko because Grand Seiko was a subdivision. It was just a it was just a flavor of that's how King Seiko is right now, still, as they always were. So what around 2017, 2018, Grand Seiko was spun off from Seiko. Seiko owns them, like the conglomerate owns them, but Grand Seiko is not a subdivision of Seiko. It's its own thing now. Now, there's still some issues because it still says Seiko on the dial as part of the name, whereas Credor doesn't have that problem, but it's still, it's separate enough. This will say Mont Blanc, and then they'll like put Minerva below it instead of, uh, I've heard people argue they should start branding the Minerva watches as an, as, like its own company, just call it Minerva. But they're not doing that right now. And I think that's part of the issue too. When you're occupying this big of a price spread, this is not healthy, I don't feel. Uh, maybe if you're a high-end luxury watchmaker, like you can say, well, Longas have like Saxonias that are starting at around $20,000 and then they, you get up over $100,000 for their perpetuals. And Patek, you know, 30,000 for a Calatrava on up to hundreds of thousands, you know, for the for the grand complication stuff. They can do that because they're already seen as an, a luxury only watch brand. When you're like entry level luxury, like Tudor pricing, starting watches, and then you're also saying you got 50,000 watches, like Tudor doesn't do that. Their most expensive thing is that gold watch. And it's only because it's gold cased, you know, the gold uh, Black Bay, which no one, in, I was going to say no one buys, but I think I actually have seen some people who own one. But, um, but th so that's my point with that is I, I think that's a, I think that's an issue that is not doing Mont Blanc any favors, but their bigger problem is they're just known as being a pin company. Ken says, I can't buy a watch from a pin company. Some reason why I can't, same reason I can't buy from leather companies like Louis Vuitton and, and Hermé. Yeah. Um, and even if, for some people, Ken, which I don't think this will shock you in any way. It extends beyond that. I know people that cannot buy like, fancy Seikos because to them Seiko is a sub $1,000 watch and they roll out anything with the Seiko name on it. Well, we'll even set grand Seiko aside and just say Seiko proper. Cause Seiko has been trying to move up price tier. And they, I mean, they all have, they had a release. I did not do a video on it. I thought about it, but it was another limited edition that they just dropped with a six R movement at $3,500 a, a watch. I believe that used to have an eight L in it or something, but now it's a six and, but it's still the price of a grand Seiko or near that. And everyone's like, what? There are people that I know would rule that out, not because the movement is the wrong movement. They'd have ruled it out with an eight series movement, uh, a Grand Seiko series movement, because it says Seiko. And they're like, nope, Seiko is a cheap watch brand. They should not be doing expensive watches. So yeah, when you have these fashion brand companies and there are going to be some examples that come up uh, or something along those lines, very, very difficult uh, for some people to do. Uh, Tuna is a big fan of Bic. And yes, if you need a cheap pen, if you need a good pen, just go with Bic. Uh, but obviously they do dispose. I don't know if they do permanent pins. They do disposable pins, but I keep a, 
because I I keep a whole bag. These are these are some of my favorites. From oh gosh, I'm now I'm shilling for Bic. These are Bic's round stick. I don't like fat pins. That's another problem with the Mont Blanc. I like really thin pins. So anyway, they're great. I use them for because I work from home a lot. I use I use pins a lot still. Take a lot of notes that way. All right. So let me catch up with the chat before we move on to what the 99 cent club member suggested, because I actually have a number of brands that uh, that you all who are who are part of that have gone ahead and suggested. So let's see. Um, we have comic. Welcome to the live stream says I am more of a pilot precise person myself. <clears throat> I am um, my favorite favorite pen. I like those because ballpoints. Excuse me, I have to cough. <clears throat> the ballpoints work like in all scenarios with all paper types for me. I like those uh, G2s, the G2 uh, pins, the rollerball pins. I'm a big fan of those as well. Problem is those things like hemorrhage ink. So I feel like I burned through a pen in six months with those. So, uh, but I, I like all sorts of pins as long as they work well. Scott says they appear to have marketing issues. They being Mont Blanc. The last show displayed a giant pin in their booth. <laughs> yes, I heard about that. I heard about that. <laughs> it was like, you have to. I, well, I understand where Ken's coming from about like, if it's a pin company, a leather bag company, you know, maybe a jewelry company, you're not wanting to go with their watches. Um, Got to distance yourself if you're at a watch show to being about the watch. Don't be about the pin. Unless your big hope is actually just to sling some pins. Like, is that really the goal? Is Mont Blanc, does, do they own Minerva's uh, movement manufacturing capabilities solely because they're using the watches as a way to, as a loss lead to try and sell? I don't think they're loss lead. I'm, this is all really hyperbole. But just in the end is their whole strategy of we've got to sell more pins. We're in a digital world and we're having trouble selling pins. Let's use watches as a way to get people to buy our pins. I I, I don't know. Uh, that seems a bit far-fetched, but I, I wonder at some of the decisions. Koji says, if you're into fountain pens, you might enjoy the Pilot Vanishing Point line. Oh, that was directed to Kim. Comic. And who, everyone, yes, everyone to their own. And uh, Koji mentions $3,500 Seiko. Yes, Koji. I, I will actually uh, bring this up uh, later in the stream uh, and share uh, share some some imagery of it but i believe it was thirty five hundred dollars i i need to i need to dig up the uh i need to dig up the footage of it because i cannot remember where i read it if it was fratello or a blog to watch or i don't think it was it was um it was um it was a blog to watch but I'll, don't worry i've got it i've got it loaded up already i found it now all right we're done with my watches uh and neff welcome to the live stream pins with that no no we would do movies with dennis first we would we would have a lot of fun with with movies with dennis all right. So, and again, uh, yeah, welcome, Neff. I'm glad you were able to make it to the live stream. Now, this uh, first one I want to hit is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to do it kind of German and say Raymond Vell, but it may be Raymond Well. Let me go ahead and share this with you. This was from uh, Luca R., who is one of the 99 Cent Club members. Luca suggested going over Raymond Well as a watch manufacturer. Now, this was one I never would have thought of, so definitely neglected on my part at the very least. Not a brand I am at all, all familiar with, and I meant to do, <laughs> to do more research on this brand today, but I have not, and I'm not sure why they are neglected. So do some of you all have thoughts on because these designs look super clean, uh, fairly conservative. It's not a it's not a weird looking watch. Um, luxury priced. Uh, they describe themselves as luxury, but I, for me, for those of you that are uh, that are new to to the channel, um, when I say luxury, I use a really super simple definition. If it's a thousand dollars or more, it's a luxury watch. We'll set aside things that we know are going to be marked down, like um, Invictus. But generally speaking, they if they sell watches, they regularly trade for over a thousand dollars. It's a luxury brand. So these, uh, you know, these have a very DeVille vibe to me, Omega DeVille, right? This is kind of a configuration that I would expect out of the DeVille. Um, so they do have their, our story and I don't know their story. Uh, like if this is, I've heard of them, but I never would have thought about them. And I don't know if this is an older brand or, or what, uh, I don't know when they formed, they say they've got involvement in the music industry. So maybe it's that they've gone, and been more like really niche, like doing, you know, 
themed watches. I don't, I don't know anything about them, but uh, Luca wanted some thoughts on it. So I'd love to know some of the thoughts in the chat. Cause my, my general impression looking at these, at these collections has been, these watches look really, really clean, maybe a bit derivative. And I, I won't even say maybe a bit derivative of other more famous watch brands. Like you see this sort of, uh, rectangular watch and you're going to probably get either a JLC, probably a JLC vibe, maybe like a Tank American vibe there. Uh, we looked earlier, I mentioned the um, the DeVille looking uh, dial configurations. These uh, Chronos, maybe they feel a little too Daytona-esque. I, you know, these definitely I get a DeVille vibe out of. So maybe that's the issue with Raymond Well is while their watchmaking might be really strong, their design aesthetic looks pretty derivative, but that would be my initial take. Hey, timepiece attorney. Let me catch up on chat. Welcome to the live stream. Glad you could make it. And let's see, we've got Koji says vile, but the watch. Okay. Raymond vile. Thank you. I always appreciate <laughs> my pronunciation and enunciation adjustments. Um, timepiece attorney. Now I can't even say attorney, right? Timepiece lawyer says, it has a fashion brand feel, but a higher tier. I could see that. Yes. So like if, the, if they're get, based off the price point, I'm assuming they are, they're well-made enough that they're not going to feel like a Daniel Wellington-esque thing, but like none of these design looks feel really, really bold to me. They look like, oh yeah, this worked with this other brand. Um, so let's go ahead and, and run with it. I mean, very, they're attractive looking uh, styles, but like, all right, so this, like with the, like, what, what is this, what does this remind you of this freelancer with the, the date that shows like that immediately, when I see a date that shows like that, then this is my gut reaction. I immediately think Parmesan, but obviously it's not a Parmesan. Um, the rest of the dial, I don't think is following the Parmesan I'm thinking of. This is one of the older Parmesan Fluyer uh, watch types, but that's a thing that I thought of with, with Parmesan for a while. Um, but anyway, yes. So yeah, I could definitely see timepiece attorney's perspective, uh, fashion brand esque feel to it. Um, uh, they're all over shop here though, in terms of hey, that's, <laughs> this is adorable. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I saw on their, their story that they were an ACD or not an AC, they were a music, uh, band theme thing. It's just kind of funny. Uh, ACDC is a really, as you can tell from my, my back wall for those again, who are, don't usually watch my channel, I'm big into pinball as well. Um, ACDC is a very famous pinball machine from 2012, kind of the resurgence of pinball. is actually sort of tacked to when ACDC was made by Stern Pinball, which today I'm actually wearing my Stern Pinball t-shirt. But enough about Stern Pinball. We're not here. This is not Pinball with Dennis. I have two podcasts on pinball that don't have my name in them, if you are at all interested in that sort of thing. So Tuna says Raymond Vels was started in the late 70s and it's kind of in a Frederic Constant. Thank you, Frederic Constant. That's I couldn't put my finger on it because, again, it's not a brand I've actually shopped. Uh, I've never owned a Frederic. Um, heard very good things. I should have probably put them in as a neglected brand. Hear very good things about a number of things that uh, Frederic Constant does, but that definitely is a look I do associate with them when I have looked at their watches. So, yes, Frederic Constant territory. I like that. I like that uh, comparison quite a bit. Neff says, I never paid much attention to Raymond Vell because they're always on the larger side, but it seems like a decent, if forgettable, brand. All right, thank you. And Tuna says, that seems expensive for a, a, a Raymond Vell. Was it the ACDC one? Yeah, some of these are getting a little, oh, let me go back to the my screen share here. Some of these are going to get in a little, I mean, nothing, I haven't seen anything that's super out of whack in my, like, okay, yeah, so we're getting over the $3,000 price point, so maybe some people are a little uncomfortable with that. Um, if you, yeah, but if you're kind of like into a homage is what the word I want to say, uh, though I, everything seems different enough that I wouldn't necessarily say like a, like a San Martin, right? Or, or a, um, what's a or Pagini design? Like, I'm not thinking like that. I don't mean that sort of like really negative form of homage where it's a clone and they just changed the name. I'm like, I'm not getting clone vibes here, but more like, let's take two ideas from two really popular watches and glue them together. It's kind of, kind of that. Uh, but yeah, some of these are, I mean, th but $3,600 for a chronograph is not is a mechanical chronograph. Isn't excessive. Like buying like what 
I was going to say, what are the cheapest uh, chronographs? Like, what are the cheapest mechanical chronographs? Hamilton has a few that are over 2000 and that's what comes to mind. But, but I don't know. It gets, it gets weird for me. Neff says, I've had my eye on that monolithic Frederick Constant. Revolution did a really good job, a uh, really good, good looking collab with that 40 hertz movement, hoping for a smaller sized monolithic. And maybe they will do that. Koji actually echoes this and says the monolithic is really cool. Uh, particularly in person. So Neff, if you get a chance, maybe handle it and see if you like how it wears in person. Then Koji didn't say it wears better in person. He just says that it's really cool in person. Um, Tiso, yeah, Tiso probably has something. I haven't priced the, uh, does anyone in the chat know? Just feel free to throw it out. Do you know what the price currently is on the Tiso uh, PRX chronos that they came out with? I didn't price them because I didn't really like the look of them. So I never looked into them. But anyway, um, so thank you uh, for that suggestion, Luca. Uh, so let me move on to the next one on the list because we got more. We got more on the list. Uh, so Scott, Scott G, he was in the live uh, live chat at least earlier. He actually gave two suggestions. He suggested as a neglected brand, Bulgari and Chopard. So let's start with Bulgari. Um, I think, I agree, neglected. I feel both of these brands have... Uh, are getting attention from collectors. I'm reminded of something Ken in the chat said earlier where he stares clear of like, if it's a pin company or a leather bag company, he's not interested in their watches. Some others might extend that to jewelry companies. And that could be as big of a, though obviously not neglected brand as Cartier, which Cartier in their own words describes themselves as we are a jewelry company first, we are watchmakers second. That they do impressive watchmaking, I think is a testament to how good they are at a lot of things but they make no bones. Like Cartier wants to be known as a jewelry brand. That they make good watches is just like a side hustle that they do. But Bulgari and Chopard, are, they do jewelry. And I know Bulgari in particular, I think is seen very much as a jewelry brand. If you, it's very hard to see with the, with the screen share. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get rid of my face and all oh, that doesn't really zoom in and all, but it's gonna say, you can see up top here, like here's, we're on watches now. They got bags and accessories, fragrances, some of this other stuff's like gifts and stuff, but jewelry, high jewelry, Serpertini 75, which I think is yet more jewelry, engagement and wedding rings, which are jewelry. So they emphasize their jewelry bona fides above their watchmaking. To me, when you say Bulgari, I think Octo Finissimo and Thin Watches. That's what I associate with them. And that is because that's where a lot of the discussion lately has been. I have not seen this special edition uh, until just now. And I'm only clicking on it solely because I feel like Bulgari did the summer blue before Omega did summer blue. Are we going to say we have summer? So if someone say I want summer blue and then someone says we have summer blue at home. And then is this the summer blue that's at home or is the Omega the summer blue that's at home? I guess this one, because this is actually cheaper than the Omega. All those Omegas that just came out. What's the cheapest one? It's the Aquaterra. Um, I was going to say the ladies size, but actually the. The, the ladies version, the th like 35 and the 41 millimeter are the same price. And they're both over 4,000. So anyway, so this would be summer blue that we have at home. Um, so Octo Finis, the Octo, there's an Octo line. They're not all ultra thin. Um, the thing is, so they've got a very distinct look. These other ones, like, I don't understand the, again, this is, you're really, I feel emphasizing that you are a jewelry brand when your brand name is around, the bezel is the brand name. Like you're, that's showboating, right? I mean, that's my that's my interpretation. Like, hey, look, I mean, you can say what you want about Rolex. The Rolex name on the dial doesn't take up most of the dial, but this is like throwing Bulgari in your face. I guess again, I mean, they make bags. It's like having LV all over the Louis Vuitton bags. You're real, you're wanting people to know what you've got. Like, Coach doesn't make a secret that it's a Coach bag. It's trying to trying to. I knew people. I worked with people who had Coach bags, and they were. It wasn't subtle. I own a Coach bag. Here it is in your face. That's what I feel with this sort of design. These, uh, but the Octo Finissimos and the Octo line, I think it's a pretty unique look. You know, different than Bell and Ross, but kind of getting some some of that vibe. The main thing I've heard about with Bulgari, it's specific, specifically the the Finissimos, the thin ones, is they wear weird. And I've I've heard multiple people say, try an Octo on. Or don't like order one. Try one on and be sure you actually like how it feels on your wrist. So that might be another issue that some people have is if it's if the brand's got a reputation that it wears strange, 
and you really need hands on. And this isn't always a brand that's, I mean, it's not in every city, not everyone's going to go and, and experience it. Um, it would, I think that's probably more part of the issue, but I think the biggest issue by Bulgari is probably neglected is they're still seen as a jewelry brand. I think, I think it's, it's more of that than anything else. Let me catch up on chat here because there are a lot of you. I, Saturdays are usually dead. Now, that's probably because my channel's boring. It'd be my assumption. But Timepiece Attorney says, I bought a pre-owned tech wear auto chrono for 600 With an option like that, I can't go with uh, Raymond Vale. No, I wouldn't either. Uh, Tag has, I actually really, you know, Tag gets a lot of static uh, in like online, like with YouTubers and, and stuff, probably YouTubers more than anyone else. I actually like a lot of their watches, especially a lot of their newer stuff uh, that they've done. And not just like the Carreras, not just the throwback, not just the Hoyer vintage stuff, but like their their dive line lately, I think looks pretty unique. Again, like a well, almost like Raymond Vale in terms of a blending of concepts, but like they're pulling from more things, like more than two brands, like maybe three to four, but they're not doing like uh, Christopher Ward the Twelve, where it feels like they took six different watches and to me, I'm sorry, sorry to all you Christopher Ward fans, and glued them all together into one watch, like. I can't get behind the 12 because it just looks like it's too much of a hodgepodge. Like this worked for all these brands and we don't want to be called just one. So we'll just glue them all together. And I just like, that is too much. It's got too much going on. That watch is too complicated for as simple of a watch as it is. So um, up, let me catch up with the uh, chat. I see some of you are discussing. I won't, won't go through what your internal discussions are. People can go back and read the chat for that. Neff says, I like that Bulgari is using aluminum. It's lighter and better looking than titanium to me. I just hate that bezel. And Scott, who suggested this, uh, said, I'm no expert, but the Octophenismia seems like high horology to me. I would personally concur, Scott. It's very difficult to make ultra thin mechanical movements. So while you might not say that it's a complicated watch in the sense that it's got a lot of or intricate complications to the time telling, when you need special devices to wind the watch because it's so small, very, very impressive. I I am uh Bulgari is the brand now that I think of them and and because of uh maybe more old timey, well, not old timey, but uh pa I'm I'm rambling. Piaget. Piaget and Bulgari are the two brands I when you tell me thin watch, those are the two I think of. It's Bulgari, and I think Bulgari first over Piaget. But that's also because when I hear Piaget, I think more women's watches than I do men's watches. And Bulgari, even though it's a known jewelry brand. I know they do a lot of men's watches. And so it just comes to my mind first. It's just how, just how it works for me. But um, Ken notes, that's right, Dennis. I prefer to buy my watches from companies that produce watches only and at least watches first and foremost. Yes. So everyone's going to have their approach and these brands have to deal with that, which is why sometimes one might argue, a la Grand Seiko, that it makes more sense to be a conglomerate, be a company, be Bulgari and make a new watch company that you own wholly and call it the Octo or whatever, and then do the watches without the baggage. Uh, pun somewhat intended since they make bags. But, you know, it's a it's a give or take because maybe Bulgari sells more watches because people go in to buy jewelry. Like uh, if a woman goes in to buy a necklace or get it fixed or something and sees a cool watch that she likes, maybe she buys a Bulgari watch because I don't know. I don't know how, what the what the logic all is. But as things become more and more online, I don't know about the whole storefront thing making in the same sense that it that it used to make uh, for, for folks like me. And I see Tuna. That's, nope, that was my that was my click. Uh, yet the Octoroma is a fine looking watch. Perhaps Piaget should be included in the list. Probably should have been, quite frankly. But I did not uh, include it myself and none of my 99 cent club members, which I've replugged in the chat. And hence why I accidentally clicked because it finally cycled when I was clicking on Tuna's name. Um, no one suggested it. So it's not there. Sorry. You all lose. We're going to move to uh, to Scott's second suggestion from the 99 Cent Club post that he provided. That's Chopard. Now, this is a brand I've looked at a lot more. I'm not like I'm not ever seriously entertained getting a Bulgari. Chopard, I spent some time looking at. I knew someone who got one of these, uh, the uh, Alpine, what, the Eagles? Yeah, the Alpine Eagles. And uh, I thought, this is an interesting look because... Again, kind of like we were talking about earlier with with uh, with Vale. Couple pieces. You look at this, and you might be go. You might be like, "All right, 
It's the flanks are extended out, kind of like a Nautilus. We've got screws, kind of like a Royal Oak, but it's a round dial face. So it's clearly not like when I look at this, I don't mistake it. Like even across the room, I don't think I would mistake this for a Royal Oak or a Nautilus. And we might say it's inspired by those two, maybe a little bit of a homage to those two, but it's got its own thing going on. And not the least of which is, oh, and I love this one that they came out with this year, the dials. Dials are unlike anything I have seen from Patek or Audemars Piguet. So that the eagle eye, because the Alpine eagle, because it's an eagle because the eye is supposed to look like, like the iris of an eagle or whatever, the eye of an eagle. So very, very distinct look. And I love this one with the small seconds and the salmon color. It looks really, really good. This is their lucent steel one that they did. They have cheaper ones than this um that don't have the same look but you don't get the you don't get the color scheme like this is like a what twenty thousand. and you can often again i think this is fair to call it a neglected brand uh so i think scott definitely was on the right track suggesting it because the um these things like gray you can get way 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 less uh but it's not just the alpine eagle that i think uh like in terms of being neglected i feel like the alpine eagle's been a the big watch from them and I think it's been neglected because people glance at it and they go, oh, homage. My, maybe the same thing Gerard Perigo might run into with some of their laureados, where it's kind of like, no, nah, it's too much like an eight uh, sort of scenario. The thing, though, is they are also a jewelry brand. Chopard is. So you see here, <laughs> you see some of the necklaces. So they've also got the same issue. I think less so than Bulgari, but same issue. Is this a jewelry company or a watch company? At least here when you go, when we went to the Bulgari site, the first four options were we're all jewelry here. It's highlights, then watches. It's not alphabetical because the jewelry is after that. So, but it's the LUC watches that I think are getting a lot more respect. If only within the last year or two, I think a lot of other people were talking Geneva seal. Um, really again, you know, as much as I love that Alpine Eagle I, and you all who, who've seen my channel know, I love dress watches. This thing is awesome. Another Lucent steel watch, but the texturing, all of that. Look at the back of the watch. So I mentioned it's Geneva sealed, uh, micro rotor. Uh, this is a beautiful watch. The This Chopard makes beautiful watches with very impressive movements. And so I definitely feel that they're neglected. I think they're trying to solve that. Um, they're kind of split, which in a way, I, actually, I think it makes sense. So they've got their Alpine Eagle sports line, and then they've got the LUC line. I've heard... Can't remember who it was. It must have been on a podcast. I heard someone argue they thought LUC LUC should be spun off. Like they they should call some of the stuff LUC and then like do it different. I don't think they need to. I think I don't think they've got uh, the problem that we have with Mont Blanc and the Minerva and the price spread being too broad. I think it's okay to have your Sport Line Alpine Eagle stuff and then have your LUC stuff and be together as the same company. I don't think there's any inherent problem with that. I so I think this I think Chopard is neglected. I think they're on the right path though and I think they are getting more attention than they did 5 years ago. They still have work to do. But with uh releases like these two salmon dial things I've shown you today, I at least there's more buzz. Whether that translates to sales, we'll have to see, but I think it will. So I think they're on the right path, but yes, I would definitely list them as as uh as a neglected brand still. Uh, that's just trying to get a foothold uh, to get more respect than the, than they currently receive. All right, so chat catch up time. Uh, Koji says LUC Chopard is still a remarkable bargain on the pre-owned market. Many of their movements, like in the Quattro, are nicely finished and have Geneva seal. Neff says Chopard is one of my favorites. That salmon 1860 uh, in lovey smiley face. I don't know the proper term for that face. But that's what we call it. In love smiley face. They even do sapphire cases, right? Um, I don't know if that was a question or they do them right. I'm going to assume it's declarative. They do them right as opposed to some of them. I've, uh, I've never been interested in sapphire cases. I, I'm, I have, I'm one of those people where I've not destroyed a sapphire crystal before, but I just have this feeling that I'm going to drop, drop it out on gravel or something. I live in gravel parts. My, my house is not on a gravel road, but I, I still drive on gravel roads quite a bit. Scott says the screws are well positioned by the Roman numerals. Uh, that would be back on the Alpine Eagle. And I do concur. I really like that. Actually, I like the Alpine Eagle better 
than definitely better than the Nautilus. Um, I'd have to look at some more Royal Oaks. A uh, Royal Oak was a watch I didn't like, but it grew on me over time. I've never been able to fall in love with the Nautilus. I just don't like the shape. Um, and I think it's uh, something to do with the dial because I'm okay with the Alpine Eagle's shape and it's still got the same flank profile uh, going on there. Oh, sorry. I meant to read this one. Koji said he agrees with Neff. And he says he would take the Salmon 1860 over even a new Patek 6119. And you'd still have a leftover $10,000, which of course is great because then with that leftover $10,000, we could buy some of the Mont Blanc watches, but not the Minerva ones. Uh, actually, you could probably buy like three of them, but but this is one of those things. Uh, Tuna also uh, applauds Chopard's uh, workmanship. And Neff says, Chopard uses sapphire cases for the sound in their chiming watches. I'm getting hit by a big storm, so I'll probably drop here in a bit. Well, thanks for stopping by, Neff. I do appreciate it. And hopefully you don't have any surge protectors uh, burn out because of a lightning storm. All right. So those were Scott's suggestions. So thank you very much, Scott. And the last suggestion that came in from my 99 Cent Club was from Ken, who has also been in the chat today. And he suggested Erwerk. I'm assuming I'm saying it right. Maybe Erwerk. But usually these W's want to be, they just want to be German, right? All right, so Erwerk. All right, Erwerk, uh, neglected, I would say absolutely. A brand I have definitely heard of. A brand I've definitely looked at in terms of I've seen them in articles. I've seen them covered on the forums. And definitely a brand I have never, I have no idea how much these watches are. I've, I just loaded up this page before I came here. Uh, and I would never entertain them. Uh, I would say the reason why I think they're neglected is if it's like, if anyone is like me, and I think a lot of people are, I know I'm a little weird, but not, not all that weird on watches. It, it's, it's too avant-garde. Avant-garde watches. I think if a brand is only built around avant-garde, it's, I think always going to be neglected because the watch designs are super polarizing. So, I mean, look at these shapes. They're very creative and the craftsmanship is there, but Erwerk in their own like materials advertises themselves as wanting to merge like traditional Swiss watchmaking with futuristic design. You do that latter part, futuristic design, and you have alienated, I'd say, the majority of the watch market already because people don't like weird. Unless it's super affordable, they might experiment. But otherwise, you have you have two options. You either have to love these designs and then people will buy them, or you have to have more money than sense. And then buying this because it's weird doesn't freak you out that you just spent a whole ton of money. Like, could you even resell this? I have, I have absolutely no idea because I don't know how much this is, but looking at how complicated this is just cycling, I'm already thinking this thing's four, uh, five figures, but uh, six, I mean, I wanted to say over a hundred thousand dollars, but I don't know. I don't know. I have to, I have to find a retailer. I have to find a retailer. Let's buy it online guys. Do we have enough 99 cent club members to buy it online? Probably not, because I have like five. Discover the retailer. I'm going through a lot of trouble to try and buy this watch. I just want you all to appreciate this. And then I see a Zen sport. <laughs> oh, Erverk. How much are we, Erverk? I'm wrong. They're not all over. Now, maybe the one I clicked on was this one's 100,000. This was only 31,000. Where was the what was the was this the one I clicked on? It sold out. It's 160. Well, we were going to buy it, but it sold out. Oh, well, I had $162,000 ready to go, too. That's really unfortunate. But I did the best I could with you guys. All right. So that's what I think. Yes, definitely. I mean, this is a brand I've heard about a lot, but I don't really see people discuss. And I think that's why it's it's so avant-garde. And the price points are um, significant because of the horology behind them. In a way, the closest example I could come up with, like, can we think of an avant-garde brand that has done really, really well with high price points? Um, uh, R Richard Richard Meal, right? It's probably the only one. And their watches, to me, always all look kind of samey all kind of just a sporty case. Uh, what's under the dial gets a little creative, but but not this creative. This is way more creative. Um, all right, so let's see. Koji says, has anyone else tried on a Royal Oak? I found it strangely uncomfortable. Maybe it's just me. I have not. Uh, we do not have an AP dealer in Kansas City. Uh, Scott said, uh, Royal Oak is nice, but twice the price. Uh, Tuna says, Erverk is just too out there to be mainstream. So he and I are in alignment there. 
Neff says, I think Irvark only makes a tiny number of watches a year. There's just not enough of them to catch on. I like them, but they're huge. Well, as avant-garde and creative as the designs are, I'm not surprised that these would wear really, really large. And I, I'm assuming, I was hoping to see them on these. Well, like, okay, so we see one on this guy's wrist, one of the designer's wrist. Eh, he might have a bigger wrist, so that, that's probably part of it. But I get it with this, like, that when you're doing shapes like this, I think it's okay to get big. Um, but it's never anyone's, like, main watch, right? It's too weird. But the price is so high that for most people, I mean, we're talking like, what was the cheapest ones I saw that on the jeweler site? It was like $30,000, right? So at $30,000 for a lot, let's say if it was going to be your main watch, you're spending like a, I mean, that's like, do you get that or Calatrava, right? Calatrava, even as a dress watch, is far more practical. Like it's going to fit in in more scenarios. This is just going to be weird and cool, but you'd never, there's already the design of it already rules it out of certain scenarios where it would look like, why are you wearing a kid's toy strapped to your wrist um, in your suit, right? You wouldn't do it. Most likely you wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. Maybe some of you might be more, uh, more engaged uh, and more uh, experimental than me. Um, Koji says the engineering of Irvik is pretty mind boggling. I'm guessing that's why Ken suggested them is because the horology behind the, the, the brand, I think, is without a doubt sub substantial, very significant. And I really respect, like, from a horological standpoint, their willingness to do this. I mean, when you're getting this creative, we're talking so much of the engineering we see now is, is derivative. And maybe it's derivative here, and I'm just, I won't know because I don't understand the engineering well enough. But what I mean is, like, oh, let's come up with a new movement. Because Patek wants to reposition the, the windows on the perpetual calendar. So it gets a new movement. But all the concepts are the same. It's not like really reorienting things. Like it's not thinking about things in a very three-dimensional way. It's three-dimensional in the sense that the movement is layered. So there will be disks and certain parts on top of each other. But outside of like moduling it up, which again is, is an easy way to solve a lot of problems, and which is why you get super thick like Valjou chronographs is because it's so modular. I think you're doing this where you're thinking more about let's put displays on the, where the lugs would be. We're going to have displays. It's like, that's really out there engineering. Like you can't, you can't take some ETA or some Minerva based thing and or JLC movement and build off of that. This is like, you, it has to be from scratch because everything is just weirdly placed. Everything's different. So Neff notes that Urvik is really expensive. Scott says he's not sure about watches that are difficult to tell time on. Seems more jewelry-like than on bo the Bagaris of the world. Okay, good point. Koji notes uh, Jacob and Company does those crazy watches. They do. Uh, Jacob and Company, though, I feel, and I don't know their catalog super well. I've looked at them a few times. Uh, they um, generally, though, seem to follow the same sort of form. Like, we're going to have a traditional round watch with a super huge domed sapphire crystal, and then we're going to world under glass. and Maybe their movements have to change each time because of all the gizmos and stuff. But the overall light, like the case always looks the same to me. Tuna indicates he'd rather buy the Calatrava than the Urvark. I would agree. Uh, but I really like the Calatrava's clean design. And now says, Beauvais is one I think should get more attention. They're pendant watches. So that will turn people off. But the craftsmanship is incredible. Pendant watches are interesting. Um, not an area I've personally really looked into, uh, actually ever looked into before, though I did see a few, I believe, at um, Only Watch this year, which I very briefly thought about covering Only Watch on this live stream. But honestly, when there's only one of something, I'm kind of like, why would we talk? About <laughs> Maybe we should have. But there are plenty of other like podcasts and stuff that have done Only Watch if you want to learn about Only Watch. But I think they do have some pendant watches, if I remember correctly, in this year's batch. So just do some searches and not, you can you can bring those up. We're actually through all of the suggestions that came into me ahead of time. So the, the ones I had research on. And of course, we've discussed some of the ones that you all in chat have had. I do want to go ahead and end on a topic that was not in the description, but because it came up earlier, because we were talking a little bit about Seiko. And that is the new Seiko Prospects 1965 Divers Recreation Limited Edition. This is the SJE093. And I mentioned it because we talked about expensive Seiko watches. So this is not a Grand Seiko. This is Seiko automatic. This is Seiko branded throwback design. I mean, I like the look of it. I actually got a Seiko branded uh, crown, closed case back. 
uh, 200 meter water resistance. So again, Seiko going to the back out. They've been doing this a lot lately and getting a lot of good attention for it. Comes in this very boring traditional style Seiko watch box. And yes, I did remember correctly. $3,500. This is $3,500 for a watch that is not powered by a um, an 8 series uh, Grand Seiko caliber movement, but instead is running on some variant of, yep, this is 6L37. So I, this watch looks really good. I've already read that many places, uh, I don't know if all of them, but many places have sold out of their allotment of this watch because it is a, is a limited run. They've limited it to 1,965 because 1965, but $3,500 for a watch with, I mean, that the 6L series is like a plus minus 10. Her, uh, it's not an accurate movement. It's, I just, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what's going on here with Seiko. And this, this sort of pricing, this is like when we talked about King Seiko a few episodes ago. And um, it's an attractive watch. I, I'm hoping at $3,500, you don't have weird chapter ring and bezel alignment issues, but I don't know. But that you're not, I get it, it's Japanese. It's, not, I don't, it's wrong for me to say COSC certified, but that, that they're selling you a $3,500 watch that's not even in COSC accuracy spec blows my mind. And yeah, you can open it up and regulate it if you want to. And I probably would, except it's $3,500. So if I had this, I'd probably use a watchmaker. But I just, I just don't, just don't get it. Great looking watch though. Uh, but of course, I love Sunburst styles. And it's gray. I mean, this is like everything I would normally want. It's gray and it's sunburst style. It's like, it's perfect. And the size is great too. I think this is a more of a throwback size on this watch. I, I wish a blog to watch laid out there. Yeah, here we go. I wish they had the specs like Hodinky does. So 12 and a half millimeters thick. So not a thick watch uh, and 38 millimeters in diameter. So really small dive watch. Very vintage, very vintage aesthetic, vintage inspired. Um, that price though, I would never buy this. Never. Okay. So anyway, so that's what I wanted to bring up about that because I remembered it from earlier in the chat. Neff said, didn't Seiko make a blue version of this a few years ago? That was 5k. I, I don't, if they did, I don't remember it. Uh, Scott says, Dennis, did you see Longa has an announcement coming this week? I believe any speculations. I did not see that they have an announcement. Um, my speculation would be because I didn't see the announcement. I don't know if there were any clues or hints in it. Where Longa has been doing a lot lately seems to be more in the realm of the chronograph. Um, so what I would wonder is for, they only had one thing at Watches and Wonders, right? They had that new, they had that new chrono, but it was really, really limited. Maybe something a little simpler than what that was that they can make more of. That'd be my, that'd be my guess. And yes, Scott, it is unfortunately limited. Of course, how much cheaper would it have been if it wasn't limited? I don't know. Because they, I mean, they, the, the 1968 reinterpretation that they just, uh, that's finally shipping this month, they limited to 15,000. I thought that was way too many. I had a ton of comments on that video telling me I was wrong. They were going to sell out of all 15,000 of those units. And the price differential between the limited and the non-limiteds, which the non-limited has looked way less cool, but it was only like 60 bucks. Granted, those were 4R movements. So I don't know. Tuna says Seiko has a glorious history of making watches for the masses, but this is a price point too far. I, I get what they're, they want to move up market. And I get that. And we can argue and we are going to have our own opinions on if they should be allowed to, or shouldn't like, is it, does it reach a point where that should be a grand Seiko piece? I don't know. Grand Seiko has got its own grammar of design thing going on. Like this watch doesn't look like something grand Seiko would put out to me. That being said, because Seiko owns Grand Seiko, they do have a history of sharing movement tech. And that this is not using an 8 Series movement at $3,500 blows my mind simply because that's a price point with that movement that I believe we've seen out of Seiko before. I lose track because Seiko's prices are all over the board. But I, ju I just don't get it. I mean, they might as well stick the 4R in. Like a, put a 4R36 in this watch, still charge 3,500. At least, again, according to more of you who who comment, who collect Seikos, I have, this is my one Seiko. That's the only Seiko I have. Those of you who collect Seikos tell me you trust the 4R movement more than the 6 Series anyway. 
So why not go with a 4R, pay the same price, and at least have a more robust movement? If you don't care about accuracy, I mean, that's what I, I don't know. I don't get it. Seiko, this is going to be an episode whining about Seiko, but I do not understand. Such a beautiful watch, too. But, uh, but I don't get it. Neff says, I'd keep the 3500 and put it towards a gray dial bathyscap. Yeah, I, I almost would have made a joke about, yeah, that you might as well just save for a bathyscap. You can get a gray market bathyscap, 38 millimeter, by the way. I don't know how much the gray one is. Um, uh, the blue one, I think I still have it bookmarked on jo Joma Shop sells. In fact, I think they're in stock. They were in stock last week. 7200. 7200, 38 millimeter bathyscap. That's going to get you uh ostensibly a more accurate watch you're gonna have a you know a gold rotor uh with the display case back um i believe it's 100 more meters of water resistance and it's a you know it's a high horology uh you know one of the most uh, we won't say let me set aside high horology uh, you get a well-respected luxury wa dive watch brand one of the most respected uh luxury dive space brands is blanc Pond. so yeah i don't know Scott says, wasn't Longa discontinuing a line? Not, uh, you know, that rings a bell, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. What would they discontinue? Not the Saxonia, right? That's like their entry level. Not the Longa one. That's their iconic. Not the Odysseus. Uh, that's what they make all their money on. Um, I'm not sure. They had something else that was in, I don't remember. Yeah, but I, that rings a bell, Scott. I thought there was something they were dropping, but I'm not sure now. I'm now I'm second guessing myself. Ken says most watches, uh, most of a watch's value is in its brand and marketing, probably ninety percent. Absolutely, and again, I get it. It's it, it's luxury goods. We're not, you know, uh, someone did an analysis of if you were to go up by a what's it, how much is a Rolex a gold the day, the day date? What is it? What is the retail of a gold day date? It's like it's over forty thousand dollars, right? Um. Someone did an analysis of it with a full gold bracelet, you know, the gold case, all of that, like the materials. And it's a, it's a very gold watch more than many other, like you buy a gold Calatrava, it comes on a leather strap, it doesn't come on a gold bracelet. It's like $4,000 worth of gold in that Rolex. So you have that and then you have about, uh, you know, time, money needed to pay for the workers. It's a very automated system at Rolex. There's not a lot of hand finishing that goes into it. So you have a watch that at least at least is 4x not just the materials but the labor costs as well like the all in the whole like net they got to be making at least 400 percent on that watch probably more and that's true i think for a lot of watches but but that's how luxury works like we all i think we all get it i, I know uh, pocket watch time had a really good video kind of uh, emphasizing this a while ago where it's like no watch is worth its price and he emphasized like the material costs of like how much Money steel's cheap. How much you know, most of the popular Rolexes are steel watches. The metal's not worth very much. The process, they make a million plus of these, 1.2 million watches a year. All of that, like the value of what they ask for versus what it costs to go in, the markup is significant. However, the the important thing to bear in mind is because it's a luxury good, as was noted by by Ken, the brand name and marketing is part of the value because these things do have value on the secondhand market. We know because there's a, there's a robust secondhand market. That's where I could say, you know, I want to buy a Explorer 2 because I know my Explorer 2 has value. Even when I got mine originally, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. I bought it used. though, So it's like, okay, well, it clearly has some level of value. And it's like, there's some level of retention. This Seiko retailed... This is one of the Save the Ocean US series. This was a like $750 retail watch. I bought it for around $500. I think they go for about $400 now. Used though, what am I going to get out of this? I'd be lucky to get $300, right? So some things take more of a hit than others. Um, and that's just, that's just how it is. So certain things, luxury brands though, like Blanc Pond, Bath is Cap. I wouldn't buy one new. Uh, outside of gray, because I don't see the point in spending $11,000 for a watch that trades under eight gray and then used, you might be able to knock another thousand off. So just certain, but you know, you still have a base value there because it's still the name commands something like having Blanc Pond on the dial commands at least $6,000 out of the bath. Cap. That's just how it is. So yeah, in a way the materials are, are almost irrelevant. The, it's what the reputation, the history the prestige of the brand, all of that's a factor in making a decision. Seiko wants to move up market 
and it was already noted earlier in the chat, Seiko is a mass market brand, but they want to be more than that. I don't know if it's because Apple Watch is taking away too much of their low end sales and they like people are buying smartwatches and that's just, I mean, it's gobbling up too much of their market share and they know they got to do what everyone else has done that survived this who isn't facing the same wrath of the smartwatch. And that is their price so far above smartwatches that it's a luxury space and they want to be in that area. But it's weird, right? Because you get the, you get the, if you're me, you get the vibe. Okay, well, Orient's going to take the place of where like Seiko 5 has been pricing, right? They want Orient to be the cheap watch. Seiko's going to move up more mid, but they're butting up against Grand Seiko now. So my thought is, what's the plan to to bump up Grand Seiko way more than what, I mean, they've been raising Grand Seiko's price. Grand Seiko five years ago would have been a neglected brand. I would have put up on this video. I won't anymore. I thought about putting Credor because Credor is one of those brands I always hear about. And I always just think, oh, it's too expensive because it's above Grand Seiko, right? But then I don't know like next to anything about it until reading Koji's article. And then I actually looked up um, uh, Credor's, like I went to their web, I'd never been to their website before until like uh, two weeks ago. It's my first time I ever been to Creator's site. So I definitely neglected it as a brand. I still don't like know how you go about getting one outside. Like the site isn't structured for Americans to go view. At least uh, when I went, it wasn't like telling me here's the US version. I was using Google Translate to translate the pages. Um, just one of those things. But anyway, Senko's trying to reposition. I just don't like, this seems like a bridge too far. But, Again, I saw, I think it was on this article. Let's let's scroll down. I think in the comment section, because I don't think I read another article on this. People were saying that they were struggling to get a hold of it. Like it was sold out at the at the dealers. But let's see. So here's a someone, RQ180 says, so the SLA017 has the 8L35 movement and it was $4,100. So this one is, he lists 3,700. Maybe he's a, might be might not be in US pricing uh with a 6L. And let's see. Way too much money for the 6L series movement. For the same price or less you can find an 8L35 base Seiko which they which they describe as basically unfinished Grand Seiko movements with very good stability. And so I I don't know. It's weird to me. Scott says, do the 50 fathoms, I asks, do the 50 fathoms take the same kind of hit on the gray secondary market? Um, they do take a hit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll probably, you know, we don't really have anything else to discuss. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and pull them up here. But um, yeah, they, they do, I believe. Um, I just don't. But they still trade for more than the because they're more expensive otherwise. But here we go. I'll, I'll do a quick share for you here. All right. So here's uh, Blanc Pond just searching. So here, 50 Fathoms automatic, um, $11,500. And they know usually the percent off is versus the retail. Um, sometimes it's the older retail. They've just recently bumped their prices. But so, yeah. So that's a watch that I thought was, well, we can, we can look at that. Um, here's another one, the Black Dial one. Here's that. Um, Here's the larger Long Pond Bothy Scap. Here's a gray one. We'll just grab a few. All right. So, yeah. So, retail is just under $16,000. So, $11,500. And this is the 45 millimeter. So, this is very traditional uh, 50 fathoms uh, sizing for that. You have the gray dial version, which retailed $15,000. It's 10950 So, again, almost 30% off. That's also a 45 millimeter. Yeah, it's just basically the different color. Uh, this is the larger, this is the 43, uh, 43.6 millimeter Bathy scap because they make a they make a 38. Uh, but you see, that's almost, it's even more off. It's 29% off. So yeah, the, the 50 fathom non-Bathy scaps take a little bit less of a hit, but we're talking like 2%. So that's under 10. Yeah, it's almost 9,000. And then this is one of the, oh, this is the 43, but not the blue. So you want the gray dial one. Actually, this blue one might be the ceramic case. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of myself. This is ceramic case. That's why it's so high. So you want to get the steel case, the larger size one, the 43. There you go. Under $8,000, 27% off. So yeah, that's how that's how it is. 
I um I'm a big fan of gray shopping. Um obviously like in this current market, like unworn, like Rolex, you might as well buy it an AD if you can get it as an at an AD because uh retail is the cheapest you can reasonably expect for most of the watches. But for a lot of other brands, uh you're giving up the manufacturer warranty, but a lot of these sites will offer you like a two-year warranty anyway. Anyway, it's one of those things. And you might even be able to get a bigger savings on uh, on Blancpain's dress. Like they're known for the dive watches, the dress watches. Um, I I think the percent pricing is generally around the around the same or so. Actually, I see I see Tuna has mentioned that Blancpain does some le- dr- lovely dress watches, most of which rarely get a mention. That's true. That's definitely neglected. Um, there are savings here on Joma around the like 23%. So less of a savings, um, 30%, a little bit more of a savings. Uh, here's one 20%. Um, so yeah, I assume Blancpain just turns out more, uh, dive watches. And so the gray market gets more of them. That's why we're seeing a bigger discount on those sort of things. Koji says you probably need a Japanese intermediary to help you out, Dennis, or travel to Tokyo. That may very well be. See, I don't, I, I have no idea if they have like retailers who deal like maybe in New York, maybe. I don't, I don't know. For then we're talking Creedor for those. No, we're back on the Creedor topic. Neff says the SLA 017 is the blue dial one that I was thinking about. People thought its price was absurd too. It's luxury, whatever it's worth to you. Yeah. And that's where Seiko is probably saying that, right? It's luxury. But the problem is, uh, as I, well, my, in my view, the problem is there's such a broad spread, right? This is the same Grand Seiko, at least because it has Grand in the name. People are are finally getting to the point where they're saying it aside and treating it differently, as Seiko wants them to, right? And they've always done with Credor, but Seiko is Seiko, so you, I, you're absolutely right, Neff. It's a luxury, it's a luxury watch, it's a luxury experience, and that is absolutely true for this new 1965 reinterpretation, but. The problem is this is the same brand that can't align its bezels on all their 4R watches, right? This was a, I lucked out that this, but I don't know if the bezel aligns in every, it aligns at the 12 with the chapter ring. So I was happy, but I didn't know I ordered it off eBay. So it's a brand where, you know, uh, what Jody with uh, just one more watch, like he, he made a rule that he wasn't going to buy Seiko's under, you know, over a certain price point because he had too many screwed up uh, bezels. And it's like, I'm assuming at $3,500, that's not a problem, but I'm assuming because I don't know. I don't know if the QC is any better. As far as I know, the only reason why this is a $3,500 watch is they put in a much nicer movement than their cheap watches. And the dials construction is probably better, but I don't know that means the alignment's any better. I don't know if it's made in a different factory. I don't know any of that. I'm hoping slash guessing that they care at luxury watch pricing because they clearly don't at a lower price point. And by that, I mean, as far as I could tell, when people have brought up and contacted Seiko about alignment issues, they say that it is within the parameters of the watch that they've sold. So they're standing by, they say the QC is ad- adequate. And obviously to collectors, that's not, that's not the case. That there's a disconnect doesn't surprise me either. Again, in pinball, this is something we see a lot of. Pinball used to be an arcade operated toy, a uh, machine, a machine to make money. Still is for a lot of ours. But so many homeowners buy now. The manufacturers have been absolutely gobsmacked at the demands. Like, why is the clear coat chipping? Or why is there, there's ghosting on the insert so that it's separating for the clear and the plastic insert where the lights are separates. Or the the uh, their dimples dimple ball stro- lands on the play field and leaves little dimples in the wood and people get mad about it and the manufacturers are like this was never a problem when this was a device like a coke machine and people would just come and play them on our at arcades the home collectors have a different standard and it doesn't matter what the price is the standard is a collector standard and seiko is sort of like they made watches for the masses and now their big buying group are collectors and collectors are really demanding. And it doesn't matter if it's a $100 watch, $1,000 watch or a $3,500 watch. They want things aligned because they collect. That's my take on it. So let's see. Uh, Scott says, might be too big for me, for, for me, but I love that blue dial titanium version. Of, oh yeah, the, the, the Bathy Scott. Yeah, I was really looking at the, the 38 millimeter uh, blue dial, but it was in steel. Um I could wear a 43. I'm sure of it. Uh, I had a 43 dive watch. Uh, I had a Tudor black bay bronze and I think the Blanc Pond, uh, lug to lug shorter. 
but I have so many dive watches already that are like this. I have my Orient. I have my, um, what's my, like, guys, tell me what my other dive watch is. I have three, don't I? Uh, the Seiko, the Orient, and, oh, my my Seamaster. They're all in that size already. So I was kind of like, maybe I'd like a 38 millimeter. But then my problem on why I bought my Zenith Chronomaster instead was um, I wasn't sure if I'd like the dive watch that small. And at that price point, you know, $7,000, I was like, $7,000 plus dollars. I was like, I just, I, I didn't want to do it. I'm still on the list for the Submariner with my Rolex 80, who I contacted this this last week. And they said, you're still there. We don't have one yet. Because they told me to check in after a couple months. It's been almost two months. Uh, but this, I point. You can't see me pointing here. This is what I'm pointing at. That. It'll give me the 38 millimeter. But I ain't paying $3,500 either for this watch. So... <laughs> So I don't know if I'd like a 38 millimeter dive watch. I normally like 38 millimeter. That, the Zenith, that 38 millimeter is an awesome size. I, I, you know, having a sub seven inch wrist, um, it was really cool. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know on things like this. So it's tough for me. Um, let's see. Neff says, Blancpain made a regular production 40 to 42 millimeter 50 fathoms and brought back the, the Le Mans. They would be on everyone's radar. And the funny thing is, I think Blancpain does do sizes like that for the 50 Fathoms for only watch. So, in fact, I think they had one this year. I don't know. It might have been a 42. I didn't. I don't remember. Uh, but if you go ahead and check it out. You can't own it because, well, actually, I don't think the auction's happened yet. You can try and own it. And if I don't know how much it will go for, I don't think there's a single only watch that goes for under $10,000. But, but, I mean, and 50 Fathoms starts at 15-ish normally. So, probably... It's probably going to go for over fifty thousand. Let's be honest. Kamek says, "Does the luxury market space need to be divided into something like a high and low luxury grouping? Though obviously, with better PR naming, uh, convention, um, do do they need to? Um, not officially, but uh, hobbyists collectors have an inclination to do it inherently." So the expression, and I kind of hate this expression because I, it's not meant pretentiously, but it kind of feels that way to me, is they'll use the phrase like entry-level luxury for certain brands. And the way they do it is um, the luxury market space, like we might see a, a company that has a really, really broad range of pricing. Um, but most of the time, people will look at where do most of their watches sell for, and they group them there. So the, and the phrase I was going to make fun of is entry-level luxury. So some people will say Omega is entry-level luxury. And the reason for that is they sell a lot of DeVille's, Constellations, Seamasters, watches that you can get for under $5,000. And so they're like, that's entry-level luxury. Like, if you're going to buy your first luxury watch, you're probably spending somewhere between one and $5,000. And, and that's true. The thing is, when you... My, Again, I, I even use the phrase. So. But my problem with it is when you say entry-level luxury, it almost implies like there's something wrong with the watches when they're actually really nice watches. I think the emphasis should be that they are luxury watches. Like an Omega is an incredibly well-built watch, even if it's the cheapest DeVille you can find. But um, so there are some that'll do that. They'll be like, there's that. And then there's mid-tier luxury. Then there's high-end luxury. And then there's like bespoke luxury. Or, uh, you know, where you're getting into like... Uh, MBNF or or custom pieces or or if not bespoke so limited like indies that are so limited that like Repexi watches and and stuff um I'm I don't know you know like Jorn's in that list somewhere things like that but um so yeah the the thing is does a brand have to carve up like that I think it's safer that's what Seiko's trying to do I thought like Creedor is they're high luxury Though there's a spread in Creedor. Like, they're really approachable Creedor-priced watches. Um, then there's Grand Seiko, which is all luxury, right? And then there's Seiko, which used to not be luxury at all, but now is luxury. Like, there are even spring di drive Seikos. And then there's all the way down to, like, sub-$200 watches, or sub-3, at least, retail. And then they've got Orient, which is entry-level watches. Like, they got watches that you can get for under 200 bucks. But they also have Orient Star, 
which gets close to a thousand. So Orient isn't really luxury. And they ended like Orient Roy Royal. Like they used to have another, I think it was Orient, Orient Royal. But, and they ended that. I assume because I thought it was encroaching too much onto Seiko territory. But it's like, I, it's a little murky when they have such a broad range. Like Seiko is luxury and non-luxury at this point. This watch is a luxury price watched watch and it's limited. It's good. It's a $3,500 watch. It's going to command $3,500. You're not going to get it at a discount. It is what it is. It's a luxury watch. But they also make all those 1968, 1969 uh, vintage reinterpretations that I covered three weeks ago. I covered one of them on a video. Um, and those are sub $300. They're not luxury. And I don't, I mean, they're all over the board. I think it's a bigger difference, not so much that the luxury market space needs to be divided between high and low, more so that it's cleaner if a brand is divided between luxury and non-luxury and not doing both things. Yeah, it does get a little bit weird with Mont Blanc and Minerva watches being really, really high priced, but most of Mont Blanc's watches would be seen as entry-level luxury pricing, Tudor pricing, really. If you want to compare them to anyone, they're priced around Tudor's price. Um, but but aside from them, most of the other brands don't have a big deal. Like Rolex on paper, like go to the store and buy a Rolex. You can get Rolexes for about $6,000, men's Rolexes, $6,000, all the way up to easily over $40,000 on the regular stuff. So they're a huge broad range and it works for them. It's not a problem. People can understand like going in and saying, okay, yeah, things like Submariner, GMT Master, that's going to be around... $10,000. Like Daytona's are going to be around $16,000. Oyster Perpetuals are going to be around $7,000, $6,000. The people can understand that. And day dates are going to be around $40,000. Like, they, they, can, they can follow that. Um, Seiko, they can't follow. I think. Let's see. Neff says, I'm not a fan of Seiko, partly because of their shoddy QC and poor accuracy. I personally wouldn't trust them at any price. Um, the QC stuff is off-putting. It's it's frustrating. And I've had like I had a Zodiac, and my QC issues were notorious, and it was so frustrating because that was entry-level luxury, right? It was like a thousand-dollar watch, and I was pretty pissed off about it. Accuracy. I don't know. I've regulated a few watches now, so I'm less concerned with accuracy. If it's again, if I'm paying a luxury price, though, I don't want to open up the watch myself, right? Um. Uh, my my Orient's accuracy wasn't great. Um, it was in spec. I regulated it. This I haven't tried to regulate. I would be comfortable trying to regulate it. Basically, if it's under $1,000, I'll open it up. I'm okay with it. Because um, I could also replace the movement if I needed to. But a lot of people don't have the stuff to do that. Um, but, you know, I regulated Vostok. It was within spec, but it, I could make it better. But the QC stuff is what, what puts me off. Uh, Tuna says these days on a budget, Tissot is hard to beat. Tissot is doing, all I'm actually, I'm really curious to see if they move up on the Morgan Stanley charts because what they have been doing lately, I mean, we know the PRX and the PRX came out and, uh, did great. I owned a PRX, uh, because I got a quartz one. I wanted to experiment and see, am I comfortable with an integrated sports watch? And what's the best way to do that? Well, find one that's affordable. Why should I buy a luxury integrated sports watch and then, you know, sell it or trade it because I don't like it? Uh, so I was, you know, I was on edge about that. Um, but so I, I ultimately I did get rid of the the PRX because it was a little big for me. I'm glad I bought a, a cheap one because, you know, I took a loss. I, sold, I think I sold it to someone in Canada. Probably the first and last time I plan to uh, <laughs> deal with uh, customs forms at the U.S. Post Office. But the um, I actually just saw on one of my pinball sites uh, the side the was it the side roll is that is that what's called the side roll I'm I'm gonna load it up here this is why I'm wondering if they're gonna move up the list so they've been doing the PRX and my concern has been they're too focused on the PRX but this watch this watch is really really cool um, like loom wise and stuff. Really fun watch 70s style through and through. Like it's so vintage. It's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's, it's almost like the ladder bracelet uh, Zeniths, right? It's so shockingly 70s that it's, it's cool about it. It's like, uh, it's almost so, it's too quiche. It's too quiche to, it's so bad. It's good. I guess is what I'm saying. 
So doing stuff like that along with the PRX, Tissot, uh, I think, this is a guess, I think uh, Swatch is giving them enough oxygen to let them do stuff now, whereas it's always, to me, been like, Swatch Group has been, oh, Omega, you're our little, like, Omega's the, think of the meme where the little kid's, like, playing, the other kid is struggling to swim, and then they show the little skeleton down at the bottom of the of the lake or whatever um, to show the favorite child. Like, Omega's definitely Swatch's favorite child, by far, easily. But I feel like they're letting Tissot uh, kind of spread its wings a bit, and I think it's working for them, because I think Tissot is kind of, Maybe curb stomping is the wrong word, but I'm going to use the phrase. I think they're kind of curb stomping micro brands at this point because they've got ETA, the Paramatic 80. They've got all of this stuff that they're able to bring like mass economies of scale to. So they're basically using a really robust three hertz, very accurate, long power reserve movement, dropping it into a bunch of cheap watches with really cool creative designs and just sort of displacing where, where I think micro brands were, were and arguably are still thriving. So Tissot, yes, I agree. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, yes, very much it is pretentious. Um, see, Neff says, Seiko doesn't delineate their tiers very well, if at all. And I don't mean Grand Seiko or Credor, just Seiko, absolutely. No, it's all over the board. Um, and that's where, again, one of the podcasts, a blog to watch weekly, which I do recommend as a podcast, if you want a podcast on watches, they uh, have a game they often play called Guess the Price of the Seiko, where one of the hosts has looked up a, sometimes I don't even know the price yet. They, they'll follow up on the following episode, but they load up the uh, a Seiko watch, read the press release for it. And then the rest of the panel, guess how much that watch is going to be. They're never right, by the way. It's all over the place because some people try and guess off of the movement, but you can't even do that accurately anymore. Like you don't know, like this is a 4R, like 4R36. This is a quote unquote King Turtle sapphire crystal ceramic bezel so this watch you know retailed 700 it uses the same movement they drop in their 135 dollars watches so you can't use the movement so you try and use the crystal but again this is a 700 sapphire crystal and we just looked at a 3500 sapphire it's just does it say is it because it says presage on the dial this new prospect this is a prospects with what 200 meters of water resistance it's the same as this but this is way more but this does have a better movement than my watch i i don't know it's weird it's weird um tuna says seiko must be a marketing manager's nightmare i don't say i i heard someone say and this comes up with grand seiko you know how they they release a new dial and they're always like this was inspired by the the you know the the winds of off of Mount Fuji blowing the leaves in the end. People are like, what are they doing? And it's like, I heard someone say, they're trying to tell a story. They know storytelling is a big thing with watches. So they're trying to tell stories like the Swiss, but they haven't quite figured it out yet. So they're almost doing it a little too literally. Almost in a way I would almost imagine Germans would try and tell a story. We're going to stereotype. Yes, this is the story. And then the story is over. But um, I don't know. It's weird. So Seiko, I don't think Seiko knows what it's doing in terms of marketing. It's, I think they're just throwing everything at the wall, but it feels like they've got a whole committee and almost like different people are just working on different projects. I don't understand why Seiko releases so many watches, not number built. I mean, models a year. Like last year, I think the final count was over 300 watches were released. Skews. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Even for an affordable brand, it's ridiculous to do that many. Ken says, I put my Mercury on a Cadora Stap and it looks just like a $13,000 dark side of the moon. I don't know what Omega was thinking, but I no longer want a real Speedy. I've never been into the Speedy. I've always found it to be a really boring design. Um, the story for me is the only interesting thing about the Speedy and uh, it just, it's not enough for me. Um, so, uh, but but I've always favored like the Seamaster line look anyway over the Speedmaster. It's just, it's never been the correct, like, Brightling and Zenith were the chronograph brands that interested me, not Omega. I've never been into Omega. Uh, so I kind of like some of their racing chronos, a little sportier, a little uh, more interesting dial stuff because I think that's what needs to stand out for them because, but I don't know. I mean, what is the price now on a Sapphire Sandwich Moon, moon Watch? It's like eight grand. I, I don't get it. I absolutely do not get it. 
Scott says, automakers have the same strategy with entry-level luxury from BMW, Mercedes, et cetera, with the goal of gaining lifelong enthusiasts. I mean, I, I, and again, it works for a brand like Rolex. I think it can work for a brand like Grand Seiko, I think has the right idea. You want to get in on Grand Seiko and you don't want to spend a lot of money, get one of their quartz movements. It's going to be like, what? It's a 9F. It's going to be super accurate. I mean, it's not like some throwaway quartz movement. It's a really respected movement, even though it's quartz. You do that. You can start really inexpensive, even new, relatively inexpensively. And then you could go high beat. You can go non-high beat. You can go spring drive. And I mean, they got a lot, they got a lot of range where there are plenty of, of watches that are, are entry level and then they move into the mid tier. Like I, I get that. It can it can definitely work. Seiko was affordable for so long. I think it can work for them too, but there needs to be some consistency. Like 6L movements probably should have a min price and a max price in watches. Like the watches that have the 6L are going to be a range and it better not be this. It better be this. And then lower is your 4R stuff. And then higher is your 8s. And don't, don't no overlap. That's this is just Dennis's non-marketing I'm not marketing trained person. Non-marketing trained perspective. You can't be doing it's too weird when the movements are spanning, sharing, Venn diagramming the price points. I think the movements need to be a clear, clear demarcating factor. If you're going to be playing in this many puddles, then carve it up. So a four, a four R 36 movement should never cost more than a six L watch. Not new. That's my, my take. Koji mentions the same thing with pianos. Oh gosh. Instruments in general. I, I mean, I've, I've heard from a few like guitar collectors and it's just like, it blows my mind. But again, how can, how can I speak? <laughs> you know, I started with it in watches and when I was collecting and it's like, I, oh, I'll never spend this money. And I was like, my watches are honestly worth more now than my pinball machines are. And pinball got ridiculous too. I started back with pinball machines. Like my first four machines, none of them cost a grand. And what's a new pinball machine in today's world? It's just like watches it's gotten crazy. It's over seven thousand dollars. I'm just, I, I remember because I remember my member berries. I'm Pepperidge Farm up on that thing. I remember when new inbox pinball machines were uh, under five, easily under five. This is different. And used were well under that. Now it's hard to find used much cheaper. Neff says, watch needs to give some love to Breguet. They are still so underrated. Yes, uh, I've I've whined about the neglect of Breguet. That would have been, and I almost put Breguet in my list for today's episode. But um, but the but the issue with Breguet lately is then they do the Type 20 and it's and it sucks, right? It's I was so disappointed in the new Type 20s. So yeah, but I agree. Uh, Breguet, I went, I don't know. In a way, it's I like the Type 20 in the sense that it's like the one thing where gay does that doesn't feel like we're, we're a pocket watch, like we're super ultra old school. And that's what I think the fundamental problem for Breguet is, is they need to do some high-end stuff that's modern looking. But aside from the Type 20, which is a sports watch, they everything is just super, and it's good looking, but very old fashioned, very Baroque. I think someone once expressed, very Baroque. So... Yeah, it's one of those things. So I see Tuna m- mentioning the gay classique, beautiful. Comic says agrees about the loving the plastic. All right, y'all like the classic. All right, they're fine. You guys just need to buy their classiques and the problem is solved. There we go. Scott has suggested a live stream on high-end quartz. Oh, I may look into that. Uh, I'm very ignorant on uh, the high-end quartz dealers. I might have to either, I have to do some research. That I'd have to crowdsource the brands um, because really aside from like retired stuff like Rolex Oyster Quartz, which they don't do anymore, or Grand Seiko. I'm very ignorant of who's doing a lot of high-end quartz. Citizen uh, has some stuff too. Uh, it could be a good episode. It could be an, it definitely could just, um, you know, for an hour's worth of content. Speaking of which, holy cow, I've gone way long. Um, I, this one actually worked out a lot better than I thought it would. Of course, we then went into a Seiko rant. So Seiko rant's good for a good hour of additional content. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream here because I think you all have heard me definitely long enough. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who stuck with it all on the live stream, I do appreciate it. If you watch the recording, skip around and get to what you want because uh, one hour, 45 minutes is way too much time to hear me uh, blather on by myself. Uh, probably do another live stream on Saturday. Been shooting for that for consistency reasons. I think people are getting used to it. 
So uh, I found consistency is very helpful. What a shock, right? I'm not Netflix. I can't dump you my entire uh, research plan for a year all at once and just let you watch them at will. Well, I guess I could as pre-recorded, but I don't. So anyway, um, thanks a lot, everyone. And I'll talk to you all on the next video. And I hope you all have a really good weekend. Take care.